Well, good to see you all. Uh, this is our first webinar of the year, and it's going to be a great one. Uh, scaffolding's always a challenge, and we've assembled a team of experts to talk to you about that. Uh, next slide, Steve. Um, want to thank our uh, advisory board for this year. Uh, as you can see, we've got a number of great companies that are uh, supporting the community of practice. Next slide, Steve. And we also have a large number of companies that have uh, quite a few members in the community of practice and uh, they tend to be quite active. So we just like to recognize these companies. Uh, next slide, Steve. Uh, we're going to uh, start in February this year, but we're looking at uh, at least one or two webinars a month for the rest of the year. Uh, we have uh, associations that are going to be speaking. We have um, the working group who, who have just established four working committees. Uh, there's a data requirements, a work phase planning, procurement and contracting, and AWP and engineering working group. All of these have been uh, coordinated with CII and with uh, COA, and uh, they're going to be complementary to what CII is already doing and uh, what COA plans to do. Um, we also have uh, conferences and summits coming up. We're going to have drop-ins for meet and greets, and uh, we're looking at uh, the possibility of looking at AWP for commercial projects as well. So expanding from uh, industrial to commercial as well. Uh, next slide, please, Steve. So uh, Steve's gonna be putting up a list of our uh, programming for this year, uh, but we have uh, events happening pretty much every second month, uh, European events, events in North America, and uh, we'll be posting them right after the event so please uh, take a look and if there's anything you're interested in or have questions about please reach out um, now let's get started on why you're here uh, i'm going to hand it over to jay moser you'll want to scan this uh, slido code because there will be some polling during your session and i'm going to let you uh, speak to the people that you want to hear from and get off camp Thank you, Lloyd. Um, so next slide, Steve. Yeah, so first of all, welcome to the CII CBA webinar on scaffold and access management. Just take a, I guess, a brief moment to thank CII for realizing that uh, the quick wins that we get as an industry from some of these joint working groups, you know, are, are I think, pretty, pretty great. We already saw a great um, outcome from the data team. And uh, I think this effort that's gone on here with this joint working group is also um, giving us a lot of good uh, we can utilize to become more productive. So this joint working group is comprised of uh, both CII members and non-members. It, it includes owners, EPCs, vendors, scaffolding providers, some of our AWP members and also non-members, um, ACE AWP consultants and software providers. Uh, this group has been meeting every two weeks over the last year, and they've been developing an AWP, AWP best practice document for scaffolding and access management. Um, I want to take a moment to thank the team. They have worked diligently. That doesn't include me. I, I've tried to, to work with them, but uh, they have been diligent and a lot of hours getting this, this done. So, you know, our research and uh, documentation focuses on scaffolding, uh, we've also tried, I think, to include topics on access management because it, it does lump together more broadly. So thanks for joining us and we look forward to hearing your questions at the end of the slides. Uh, next slide, Steve. So this group was formed to address, you know, one of the biggest issues I think that we have uh, within the industry. Um, so the most owners would agree uh, that, that scaffolding costs are large and they need to be optimized. I mean, we're, these represent anywhere from you know 20 to 40% of major projects 
depending upon how it's managed. So despite you know being a large portion of the overall cost, scaffolding, we just historically don't give it enough tension and we don't give it the credibility and the attention that it deserves when it comes to advanced work packaging. So the goal of this joint working group was to create a best practice, a handbook um, that's specific to scaffolding and access management. Uh, if successful, I think it's already successful, but you know the document will help move more quickly the industry into defining execu executable details that uh, we can realize ABP planning and productivity benefits and uh, and help support um, reducing costs of, of our projects. So to kick this off, I'm going to turn it over to Josh Gervin, our, our co-chair. Josh, uh, take it away. Absolutely. Thanks, Jay. And next slide, please, Steve. Oh, uh, forward there, Steve. Great. So just to level set for today, who, what, when, where of this group, uh, the status today, we have uh, completed the report out as well as an infographic summary. There's a link in the slides here. We can also uh, share that in the chat where you can uh, hopefully see also a link for the Slido where you can be adding questions as we go. Uh, the infographic is available uh, publicly to everyone, so you'll be able to get to that information through that link. In terms of next steps, we are prioritizing the areas of expanding that report uh, for our efforts this year, and uh, very excited to announce that Andrew Foy uh, uh, is going to be taking over the leadership role in this a joint working group as I'm now focusing on launching the engineering joint working group for AWP for CII. Uh, so Andrew uh, is joining Jay. I'm still remaining part of this, but going to be handing it over uh, to Andrew. And you'll see that throughout this conversation as well as Andrew takes over. So if you are interested in joining, please email Andrew Foy, Andrew at O3.solutions uh, to join the team. You can see the other members listed below as well. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> And do want to point out that uh, there is a significant document available here. This best practices document is about 50 pages long, goes into some real detail around uh, the, the best practice itself, the uh, way we should be thinking about project controls and other aspects of uh, uh, addressing scaffold and access management from an AWP perspective, and you'll hear more of those details here. Uh, but there is a significant body of work available as well as this 10-page uh, infographic summary that can use uh, you can use to help educate your organization. So both of those tools are available, and now we are moving on to focus on what we want to do next, which is a attacking some of those implementation barriers. Now that we've established what right looks like, we wanna build the tools that help people to drive right within their organization. So there'll be things around ROI, contract strategies, value channels, uh, barriers, and, and strategies to overcoming those. Uh, so that's our focus. We'd love to have more people join and help us to uh, drive this forward. So if you are interested, uh, please do reach out. Uh, we'd love to have you on the team. With that, I'm going to hand it over to the uh, new chair uh, person, Andrew Foy. Thank you very much, Josh, and thank you for the transition. So why are we here today? What's the purpose of this presentation? So firstly, what we want to do is we want to share the success and the learnings that we've had over the last year that's culminated in the presentation of that report and that infographic. So we wanna make sure that people are aware of what it is, where it is, and how you can download it. And then for the agenda for the meeting today, we're gonna to cover who we are as a joint working group, why this is important, which Jay's already started to touch on, how we approach to this problem in terms of how do you tackle scaffolding and access management from an AWP perspective? What did we find out? What are the initial findings? What should you remember? Some of the key takeaways, if you only hear three or four things from this whole presentation, what are the key takeaways and what do you want to know? Next slide, please. So introducing the people that you're gonna be hearing from today, Josh Gervin, the CEO of O3 Solutions, Jay Moser with Shell, you've heard from both of those gentlemen already, Colin Choi with Floor, Stefan Poch with Leia, Rick Dunlap with Brand Safeway, and myself, Andrew Foy from O3 Solutions. And with that, I will put you into the good hands of the team and pass it over to Stefan. Next slide. Thank you. 
All right, thank you. So first question of the day is um, uh, for everybody, how often have you experienced budget overrun for accident scaffold? So you can scan uh, this QR code and make a choice. Okay, there's still answers coming in. Um, but there seems to be a strong trend, obviously, that there's a lot of times that we have scaffold and access projects where we have, obviously, budget overruns. Um, throughout this uh, presentation, we will talk a little bit about what, why this, why we believe that the reason uh, for these budget overruns, uh, what the root cause is, and obviously what we can do to uh, make scaffold costs more predictable. So let's wait a few more seconds and then I would ask Andrew to move it to the next slide. Okay, that's pretty stable. So thank you very much for your answers and next slide. All right, so from that slide, oh, we can see that out of uh, out of the responses, there were forty five percent often, and I didn't see the number, but it was uh, it was a significant percentage. It said almost always, so more than half the time uh, on the projects, we were seeing. Uh, yeah, there we go, eighteen percent almost always, and forty four percent often. So over sixty percent of uh, of the time, we're seeing cost overruns on on access and scaffolding on a project. So that I think underscores uh, you know the importance of the topic we're talking about. So when we talk about why scaff why access management matters um it comes down to a couple of really key things and first of course question just that we just asked um the cost of access and we break down the cost of access into two separate components um specifically one is the cost of the labor and the second is the cost of material so we heard uh jay's intro at the beginning that scaffold is uh 20 percent of construction costs and we break that down further on the labor side, um, based on historical data, we see that scaffold can be um, anywhere from 15 to 30 percent of EFL hours. Um, in other words, for every direct field labor hour that is spent on a project, um, or for every let's let's use different numbers, for every hundred direct field labor hours spent on a project, you will be spending 15 to 30 hours on scaffold, which is pretty significant. And by the way, that 15 to 30 percent range. Uh, is not all inclusive. I've, I've certainly heard of projects that have gone even above that range, although that's not quite as common. The other aspect of scaffold costs is the cost of material itself. And in most projects, they operate with scaffold as a rental material. So it's not just how much scaffold you use, but also how, much, how long that scaffold is left standing for that can affect that. And a lot of the time, scaffold costs are estimated uh, on a basis of how many hours of scaffold labor you expect to expend, and then how many dollars per scaffold hour you expect to spend. And that's uh, that's an approximation or a, a, a method of estimating, but it doesn't reflect the um, what really goes on on the project site, which is that the rental, the duration of the rental really does impact the cost as well. So there's the actual cost of building the scaffold and having the scaffold material. But then there's an equally big component and a less visible component to the cost of scaffold access, which is the impacts when the access isn't there when it's needed. So it's looking at the productivity and the scheduling impacts um, from waiting for scaffold, from not having scaffold, from needing to adjust scaffolds, et cetera, et cetera. So those are, those are some of the major components behind costs. And when we, dig a little bit deeper, we find there's a few common issues that lead to those those cost issues that we find. Um, one is uh, one of those major issues is a siloed approach. And when we think about siloed approach, we break that down in this discussion into two components. One is the supply side and one is the demand side. So by the supply side, I mean 
who supplies the scaffold and how that scaffold is applied. And typically, uh, especially on large projects with multiple contractors and subcontractors, um, a lot of the time each company has it within their contract to arrange their own scaffolding. So a company might bring a few scaffolders on or they might subcontract scaffolding out. And what we find is a, a fractured landscape of who provides scaffold on a site. And you might have many different scaffold providers all working within close vicinity with, with each other and all on the same site, but using different material that don't necessarily work together and encroaching on the space that each, um, each provider needs. So the, all those conflicts create problems because if one company needs to access an area um, and a, the next subcontractor also needs to access the same area, one scaffold needs to go down and another scaffold needs to go up, maybe the exact same scaffold covering the exact same work run. So that's a siloed approach from a supply side perspective. And there's also a siloed approach from a demand side perspective as well. So having each discipline or each trade or each subcontractor requesting scaffold as they need it um, and that there's some uh, missed opportunities in terms of having say the pipe fitters and the welders and the insulators that come right after them share the same scaffold uh, you may not have if, if each discipline and trade are requesting scaffold as they need it you might miss the opportunities to leave a scaffold up for for a week or two and save many hours of dismantling and re-erecting a scaffold uh, another common issue that that uh we've seen in our collective experience is the knowledge of advanced work packaging um, as it applies to scaffolding is, is limited um, within the industry. And up until very recently, um, and certainly when work-based planning was, was picked up as, as, as the way to, way to execute projects on a construction site, uh, scaffold was treated as a constraint. In other words, in, in, an, uh, in, the, uh, in the work plans, Scaffold was a box on the form that basically said, is scaffold available? Just like we asked the question, is the tools available or is the equipment available? We're treating scaffold as a, a, a yes or no question rather than treating it as a, a full on discipline that requires pre-planning and, and execution management. And that's what we mean by scats, access is treated as a constraint. And then you, because of that, um, because of that, Ask Scaffold is actually also um, looked at from a reactive, um, demand-driven um, perspective at the IWP level. In other words, when an IWP requires scaffolding, that's when it's really looked at, rather than being looked at holistically on a project level and being planned further out ahead. So those are some of the issues we see. Next slide, please. So with those common issues, we've uh, taken an approach of breaking down the best practice into six different sections. And we'll cover each of those as we go through this pre today's presentation. Uh, we'll talk about contracting strategies um, and setting up the commercial um, and, and, and strategic framework that allows for uh, efficient scaffold execution. We talk about the AWP framework, how do we plan ahead um, and, and set up the project for good pre-planning and good execution planning and management as we go through um, as we get into the field. We'll talk a little bit about project controls and some of the, the numbers and looking at costs and schedule behind scaffolding. And then lastly, we'll wrap up with education and training, what we need to do to get the workforce ready for this AW, AWP uh, approach to scaffolding. So next slide, please. And Rick will walk us through another Slido question. Yeah, so thanks, Colin. So this is a bit of a leading question for the material I'll cover in the next slide, but I, I think it's pertinent to how you look at it. In your projects, do you do you consider access and scaffold a trade, or is it typically wrapped up as part of the total product that's being installed? So I, I, I think this has been one of the things that, um, from a scaffold provider, provider perspective that we've been very focused on over the last four or five years. And we're starting to see that change, mainly due to the spend and the impact of the project that uh, Colin and others have described. But we have to figure out how to uh, integrate, you know, scaffold and access providers into this process. So we had about 30, 35 respondents on the last one. So I think we're sticking 
So long story short, looks like um, industry in general is starting to address the access spend uh, as, as an issue and starting to engage their providers. So that's a good thing. Um, we can go to the next slide, I think. I think we're good. Yeah, so, so to make that happen, how to treat a, uh, an access provider as a discipline, we really thought about what are some foundational items to do that. And, and we think it really sort of comes, comes back to the project or the owner's contracting and commercial strategies. If we're going to work together, we need to be able to be enabled to work together, you know, kind of summarily stated. So the good thing about you know, the AWP framework is that it's already produced really good results. Um, we're seeing you know, huge maturity model gains. You know, when we work with others in construction, people are getting more and more sophisticated around the model. They're starting to see some of the benefits. And, and really what, what I like about it is that standard process. So we get common framework, we know what we're trying to accomplish. We use the same language and we're starting to get, you know, where we even use some of the same data points to, to some of Collins points, which really helps us. If, if it's not that way, then we're all sort of managing our own contract model or our own project control process in, a, in that silo. And being able to talk about that holistically as a project delivery uh, ecosystem is really important. So as mentioned, right, the, the challenges really are that when there's a major project um, in the field, there's multiple contract models out there and those all have very unique uh, constraints within them. And they're all focused on mitigating risk and delivering that project, but they're done so sort of in that silo, we have to get away from that. And what we find is that many times the major contracts may be well aligned, but all the subsequent contracts, not so much. So your secondary and tertiary level providers that are supporting the project may not have any alignment and may not really have any awareness uh, of what's really happening. And not only that, one of the things that we that we find is the people, you know, people arranging these commercial strategies and contracting methodologies they're often not up to speed on really what AWP is trying to accomplish, what the framework looks like, how they can help enable it. And so by pointing that, you know, pointing that out very early, I think we can set the, you know, set the course for being successful. But some of the, some of the results are really pretty, you know, pretty, I would say mundane, right? We're still having challenges with access spins, we're seeing multiple access providers kind of doing their own thing in multiple ways on a project. And really and truly what, 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 what it really devolves to is people are focused on managing their contract versus sort of the overall project outcome. And then that, that accountability thing sort of, you know, it's sort of past the buck. And what we end up with is the client or the project owner ends up with lack of control and cost, especially around access. So, the, the way we see getting out of this is thinking about it in the contracting and commercial strategy. Um, make sure that those things are aligned with all the providers uh, in the AWP framework. Um, drive and own at the owner level. So if if a tertiary level contractor is is very engaged, but um, he can't speak for the entire you know, mega project. So the owner and, and or the EPC, the majors really need to help carry the message and cascade it through all their provider network, subcontracts, but also more importantly, some of their extended functional teams. One of the, one of the points that we, that we really you know, talked about a lot in this joint working group was, and we're gonna, you're gonna see some of that in the education is that some of the teams, you know, in the trailer doing the work, they very much understand the model and what the what the goal and what the process steps are. But a lot of the extended functions don't necessarily understand that. And we need to help improve that. And, you know, ultimately what we end up with is a better uh, access management approach, better provider strategies. The project and the owner have standard uh, requirements, standard data, and ultimately much more control. So. Um, we think it starts with the contract. So next slide, Stephen. Just to, just to explain a little bit more uh, on that topic, 
if you think about how we do access in a in a non AWP method, what what we find is there's a need to find the work gets performed, and it's essentially one need uh, with one action to address that need, whether it's a constraint or it's a work order or whatever it may be. And the 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 part of the challenge that we sort of kind of peeled the onion back on in in the current AWP approaches. It's sort of the same parallel. It's really a need is defined and work is performed via that IWP where access is treated as a constraint. So we're really still doing constraint management. One need results in one action and that strategic approach is really not there. So the similar results and, and the, you know, kind of say that there's something more to do and, and you know, what's missing is that access strategy and everyone's still sort of planning in their silo. So the opportunity we see is leverage a shared service provider model, right? Access, whether it's one provider, two providers, however it works, if they're using common framework, uh, good data standards, and we know what the process is for that uh, project, uh, that can work very effectively. We can start to think about creating access strategy at the CWAs, the construction work areas, or even the construction work packages. And we can get ourselves out of that, um, that one, one scope and one action sort of environment and get to uh, understanding many scopes in a single work face area and address that. So we can literally take you know, numbers of access requirements out, man hours out, safety exposure hours out, and ultimately, you know, whether we do that, you know, in, intradiscipline or interdiscipline, I think we have to start with, you know, intradiscipline and ultimately get to all the disciplines in a specific work area and start to take that stuff out. Go ahead, Stephen. So the, the next question is, is the impact of scaffold access to the work being performed by others critical or important? It's, again, it's a pretty leading question, but it's very straightforward. Um, I think it's important for people to actually answer it. So, yeah. so, so being around the, the industry for many years now, more than I care to uh, admit, um, I would say that roughly 80 to 90% of the scopes uh, on an average uh, capital project are impacted by access. At least that's my experience, some form or another. Doesn't necessarily always mean a scaffold, could be mechanical lifts, could be a variety of other things. We're seeing you know, rope access becoming more and more prevalent. We're even seeing you know, innovation around you know, using drones and other things to provide the same level of inspection versus building a scaffold. But the point is, is that what we do with access is very important to actually creating, building, and installing the assets for our customers. And I think I think the industry agrees, guys. So, um, next slide, Stephen. All right. Uh, well, thank you, Rick, and thank you, Colin, for for paving the way um, to this slide. So. Um, to recap a little bit, we looked uh, at the current IW, um, IWP process. So as you can imagine, uh, we talked about a siloed approach and everybody bringing his own scaffold. It's not really pointing fingers that it's anybody's fault. It's more to say it in, in terms of the upcoming Super Bowl, it's the game we play. The game we play right now is basically you have one trade, let's say an electrician or welder, uh, an IWP level that needs a scaffold. And that scaffold is being built to that particular trade uh, trades requirement. So if you ever wondered on a construction side why there's so many individual scaffolds standing around and sometimes they look a little bit uncoordinated, it's really the current process that produces all these individual scaffolds uh, and change orders and things of that nature that ultimately cause the budget overrun. So this relationship, IWP, one scope, one scaffold, is at the core of the challenge. Um, now, I do want to make also a positive thing about this approach because it's not all negative. The positive approach is that it's a fairly simple, uh, it, it does, or let's put it this way, it doesn't require a lot of 
deep expertise. As you can imagine, if somebody knows exactly what he needs on a scaffold, one scope, you build one particular scaffold. Um, the challenge becomes, obviously, if you want to get ahead of the game. Uh, next slide, please. Okay. Um, so if you want to gain what we call one-to-many or multi-trade scaffolds, obviously, you need to change the game. Um, if you look at the left side, left side, you see the typical planning here is hierarchy for CapEx projects. Uh, one thing, as also I should say Rick and, and uh, Colin mentioned earlier, is uh, it can access, and every owner knows that access is a very expensive um, line item, not only during construction, but also during the commissioning and the maintenance or the, the running of, of the facility. So during engineering, you could probably think about it to include access or access strategies as part of the overall life cycle of the plant. Um, and we also think that there's real innovations and cost savings uh, possible. But to go back to just the capital project to the construction side, uh, we already believe that it would be a major step up in to include uh, scaffold and access as a trade at CWA, CWP level. So on the right side, you can see the scaffold planner that used to plan each individual IWP work package or one scope, one scaffold, now got to sit on the table with all the trades and figure out a scaffold that basically meets the requirements of all, all the different trades and scopes. So the idea is to get not every scaffold, obviously, in this range, but let's say your major pipe breaks, your boilers, your tanks, to build a scaffold that many, many uh, trades can, can use uh, probably with long standing times. Now, as Rick mentioned, why is the ecosystem so important? Well, obviously, right now, you're building a scaffold structure that is probably much bigger uh, than, for example, an individual scaffold for an individual trade. You need scaffold expertise. You need to have, um, obviously, a contract system in place that enables this expertise and also the execution of that scaffold contract. And most important, uh, as Rick pointed out earlier, is um, a common language is required so that everybody understands uh, the electrician and the, and the structural guy, as well as the scaffold plan, what scaffold needs to be built in order to have accountability later on. So, but we believe that in, including uh, the scaffold planner during the CWA, CWP level already will have major benefits um, in terms of the predictability of cost, uh, but also in terms of cost savings. So, next slide. Yeah, thanks, Colin, or um, Stefan, appreciate it. So one of the questions that, that pops up is, you know, Colin touched on, do we, do we just estimate level of effort in terms of hours, or do we actually measure scaffold performance? And scaffold performance can be measured in a variety of ways. It can still be, obviously, that, that PI or productivity index is obviously valuable, but are there some other things that we need to measure, right? And, and, and I think one of the challenges we have is not only should we measure scaffold performance of the provider, but also maybe scaffold performance or access performance of the access users, right? And so there's a lot of things to talk about in that, in that uh, onion as you peel it back. So um, AWP gives us, a couple of advantages, right? We can start to talk about scopes in a pretty concise fashion. We can start to measure quantities in terms of hours or pounds or other things. We can get very creative. So um, for the most part, uh, it looks like scaffolds sort of a cost center <laughs> wrapped into uh, other disciplines is what the math says to me on the chart here. So. Okay, go ahead, next slide. So it looks like from that Slido question, about half the pro half the uh, respondents on this call uh, were not measuring scaffold performance or not yet. And about a third were saying scaffold is measured on individual projects. Um, I think what we're, what, what, when you look through the best practice, um, I wanna pick out a few key points that you'll notice and, and talk a little bit on those. And the first is, um, using quantities uh, on projects. The typical industry practice is that during the estimating phase, we estimate based on a, uh, 
a ratio to direct field labor hours. And then based on that, we put a dollar per hour on the cost of the scaffold material. But nowhere in that equation do we actually estimate the quantity of scaffold being used on the project. So what the best practice is suggesting is that earlier on in the project during feed, we need to take some efforts and expend that effort to develop a quantity so that the estimate is not just a dollar for scaffolding, but rather a quantity for scaffolding, just like we do with pipe or concrete or any other of the direct trades. We know what the quantity is because we need that quantity to execute and control the execution of that project. So having quantities enables earned value progress. And earned value is something we do in a direct trade, but we don't do in scaffolding because up until this point, we can't. Up until you have quantities, you can't. Um, and that also means not having quantities means you cannot do proper change management on scaffolding. Because if the scaffolding cost changes, well, why did it change? Did we build more scaffolds than we intended? Were the scaffolds more elaborate than we originally envisioned? Was, was the labor spending more time to build the same structure um, than we envisioned? Having a quantity would allow us to answer those questions and do change management and trending and forecasting accordingly. But without that quantity, we don't have that ability and scaffold just becomes a dollar that's run over. So that's the first point that, that, that we um, argue in the, in the best practices. You need quantities to do anything else and therefore, you have to invest in that quantity upfront in order to have it for the rest of the project. The second point uh, is cost accountability. So scaffold is typically measured or, or put into a, a, an estimate as a line item and, and tracked as a line item in and of itself. But that, all, that, that means that the people that request the scaffolds, you can't necessarily differentiate. So whether it's the pipe fitters that request a lot of scaffold or the iron workers or uh, insulators or painters or whoever that might be, if you're not able to track where those scaffold requests are coming from, the scaffolders themselves, they're just responding to those requests. So to say that scaffolding is running over um, in and of itself doesn't mean much and it doesn't give you a lot of actionable um, uh, insight into what's causing it. But by tracking the scaffold requests, where they're coming from, which contractor or which trade they're coming from, you now have a little more insight that you can action and say, well, is this group, is this particular group that's requesting more scaffold than we originally planned? Is that, is that good for the project? Is that the right thing that needs to be happening right now? And what can be done to address that? Another thing about cost accountability is separating out uh, non-access scaffold from access scaffold. So what we mean by that is scaffold that's used to access a work front, the way we typically think of scaffolding, is what you want to measure. But then scaffold is also used for a lot of other uses on a project that aren't necessarily access related. For example, in a cold climate situation, you might use scaffold for heating and hoarding to keep something warm to do a concrete pour or a well, for instance. That's not access related scaffold. And in order to compare against other projects, you cannot count that as part of your scaffold cost. Or if you use scaffold to say, build a pedestrian walkway to keep vehicular and pedestrian traffic separate, that's not access related scaffold. You need to pull those out in order to, um, to do proper comparisons. Another thing we talk about is incentivizing alternate means of access. So scaffolding as convenient and as useful as that is on a project, um, there are other technologies and other ways of accessing a work front that needs to be considered as well, uh, such as using um, using uh, a aerial work platform or a scissor lift, or using rope access or the latest kind of technology that's that's um, that's able to take the place of in some cases of scaffolding is using drones and drone footage, drone video footage, um, in the place of physical inspections. So those are some examples of alternate means of access. And on a typical project, those are put in a separate bucket. So when you use equipment, it goes towards the equipment budget. When you use drones, that goes towards uh, sometimes a technology or an IT budget. And it doesn't, by, by putting those budgets somewhere else, it doesn't incentivize the use of, of those alternate means of access, even if they do have an overall cost savings. Um, it doesn't necessarily incentivize that because it goes to someone else's budget and someone else has to approve it. So those are some things that we need to think about in terms of how we set up the project control side of things 
to incentivize the lowest cost way to access and to incentivize control of who's requesting this capital and how much they're requesting. The last thing in the, uh, in the best practice is uh, metrics and benchmarking. So talking, there's some recommended leading and lagging indicators. And in the interest of time for this presentation, I won't go into it, but if you look into the practice, we do recommend a list of leading and lagging indicators um, that can help you uh, understand what's going on. And particularly with the implementation of quantity-based estimates and quantities throughout the, the, the job, there are a lot of new lag, leading and lagging indicators that have come up um, that, that we think will be very useful. And last but not least, and this one requires a bit of a community consensus, but something that we suggest considering um, as part of this best practice is for the community get together and establish a common unit of measure. You know, in the last slide, we saw a lot of projects or a lot of respondents saying that they measure scaffold on a project by project basis, which is helpful on, on an individual project. But one of the, uh, the, the, the strengths of having the data, um, especially if your company executes multiple projects, is to be able to compare between those projects. And better yet, having an industry benchmark that all the projects can contribute to and compare to. Um, and that requires a common unit of measure. Um, within the, the industry, there are different ways of measuring scaffold, whether it's by lake feet, by pounds, by volume. Um, all those different measures work great in and of themselves, but, when, but it makes it very hard to compare between projects. And that's something that we as a community need to decide together that this is worth doing and move towards that common unit of measure. So with that, um, we'll move on to the next topic in the, uh, in the best practice. Uh, we'll go to Rick for another Slido question. Yeah, Colin, I'm not sure how my, my, uh, my shiny head got on all the question slides, but that's okay, I'll do it. I'm following the orders. So Sort, sort of as I touched on um, earlier in some of the strategy slides, you know, one of the things that we see is, you know, do you really include your scaffold and access management teams in your AWP training program? And AWP training program sort of is, can, can be interpreted a couple of ways, whether it's AWP training program for your specific project or it's just industry training in general about what the AWP WFP model is. I think it's important that your your stakeholders in your facility or your project um, you know, be included in that training, both industry level training as well as project specific process training as it relates to AWP. So it's good that um, the majority do. I can tell you just a couple of short years ago, that was not the answer. Uh, the answer was 20, 2080, right? Um, not not 6040. So we're making some headway. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to uh, the next slide and Andrew, I believe. Thank you very much, Rick. Yeah, I must say I'm uh... I'm impressed by the answer to that, that we're getting almost 40% of people, including access and scaffolds in their AWP training program. So training is going to be critical, especially for anybody who's introducing AWP in general to their organization or trying to take the next step in their AWP journey by introducing something like scaffold and access management. This is not typically the first thing that you're going to tackle on your AWP journey. Most people focus on pipe and steel and electrical when they first start out. So this is something we're seeing as part of that sort of continuing growth of AWP development. But to do this properly, people need to be trained. People need to understand what their role in it is, why we're doing it, what are we focusing on? So part of what we're proposing in the, uh, in the report that we've put out there is multiple levels of AWP training. And these are gonna be different depending on the role that the person plays in the organization, in the project. So those are going to be awareness training, execution training, and early scoping training. And we're going to be looking at the various roles within each project team to say who needs to go through which of these. So next slide, please. So the awareness training is for anybody who needs to understand the basic concept, who needs to understand why we need to focus on access management, but doesn't actually have a day-to-day -day role involved in it. 
So this is going to be people like, quite honestly, your project managers, your, your project decision makers who aren't going to play an active role, but they're going to have an influence over the decisions you make with scaffolding and access management. So including them in this awareness training, it's much like educating your executive team on the use of AWP. They're not going to do it, but they need to know what it is and why we're talking about doing it. And they're always going to want to know what's the benefit to us. Then looking at the early scoping training. So this, a lot of this breaks into two different sections. So we're talking about the, the use of scaffold and access management assessment of projects in the early stages. And that's going to be FEL2, FEL3, or select and define, depending on your terminology. So this is going to be when you get a scaffolding professional to come into the project team in those early stages and look at the project from a CWA perspective, look at the major scaffolds that are going to need to be designed, the major pieces of equipment, and start helping with some of that early phase planning. So this essentially is going to cover anybody who's going to be involved in that early integration, in that early scoping. You're going to want to get the right people in so you can make smart decisions. This is exactly the same concept as AWP in general or constructability. If you bring us in early enough, we can have a bigger influence. If you wait until two weeks before construction starts, you're going to get what you're going to get. So this early scoping training is starting to identify who needs to be involved, what it is they're going to look to achieve. And to be clear, we are not advocating that you are going to design every scaffold on every project. In this early scoping stage, you're going to look at the major impacts. You're going to look at the, the biggest pieces of equipment, the major areas, areas where you can save and be more efficient. And then you'll always have a carryover percentage of field design, field managed work. Lastly, we're going to look at execution training. And execution training is when you're in the field. This is going to cover the work phase planners, the people who are managing your scaffolds in the field, making those requests, trying to get away, as we already said earlier here, getting away from that one-to-one, -one, getting away from that reactionary, oops, I need something next week, please go and throw something together for me. So this is going to cover how do the work phase planners, the non-scaffolding ones, when they're creating their IWPs, how do they request a scaffold? How does the scaffold coordinator collate all that information and produce realistic, multidisciplinary, effective and efficient scaffolds that are going to support all of the trades? So this is where you're going to need, if you're going to implement this, you're going to need to educate your people, understand what their role is and be able to speak the language to them and explain it to them in a way that supports what they're going to do on the project. And with that, I will hand it back to Rick. Rick, you're up again. Rick, I believe you're on mute. Yeah, thanks, Josh. I was on mute. I clicked it. But, um, with that, I appreciate it. I'm going to cover these quick. Uh, the group came up with five pretty core foundational things that I think uh, you could all use as sort of our key recommendations. And as Andrew just finished up on, develop the scaffold and access strategy um, during the early phase. If we wait till the end, if we wait till construction, we're not going to change anything. The only thing we can affect is being lean on individual scopes, but we're not going to actually take hours out of the process in terms of duplication, waste, alignment with other users. Um, treating access as a shared service, uh, supporting all trades and contractors. Tell us what you need, tell us when you need it, tell us how you need it, and where is it at, and let us align those different users in the work phase. Save some money, save some hours. Um, to do that, we really need to elevate access to a discipline. Um, that allows us to understand the work packaging system, the stakeholders in that system, what the workflow looks like, how to interact, how to, how to find those many to one access opportunities. Um, maximizing the use of multi-trade scaffolds versus those, those siloed approaches of piping contractor one, two, and three all have their priority of the day and that's what we react to. That's not a good way to execute. And then last but not least, sort of in the education vein, let's continue to train the contractors and the owner's functional teams. 
on what the AWP methodology is and its specific application to the project and access. So that's the key takeaways, our recommendations. Next slide. Okay, last up, and we want to save a few minutes for questions, so I'll be quick with this. Call to action. What you so far is phase one. We are going to be going into phase two this year. We've already started to look at what our plans are for the year. And as Josh talked about, we're going to look at things like what are the barriers to getting to this best case scenario here. If you want to be involved, please reach out. It's an open group and it doesn't require CI membership. As Jay mentioned at the beginning, we are a member and non-member team. So if anyone's interested in joining us, please contact me at andrew at o3.solutions to sign up. So with that, thank you very much for the team, for everybody presenting today. Thank you all very much in the audience for sitting in and listening in. And we've got a few minutes at the end available for Q&A. Questions can be put into Slido. You can upvote the questions that are already in there so that we can make sure we're talking about the ones that you have most interest in. Okay, so let's get started with, have you gotten multiple, oh, ah, just as I was reading it, have you got multiple trades to work together on scaffolding? Any tips? Well, Rick, I'm going to pick on you for that one, if I might. Yeah, absolutely. So key to that is the the project, if it has an ecosystem and we're all trying to deliver the same project, that means that our owner or project leadership team has said, you will follow a process. You need to follow a process. Here's how it adds value. And we sort of control that process. Uh, and hold people accountable to comply with it, and then we're accountable to deliver in it. That's really the trick. Um, if we don't deliver and it doesn't work, then people typically say, well, I have to take care of what I'm responsible for. I'll figure out how to do it on my own. We have to take that away. We have to do it at the beginning, as mentioned. Excellent. Thank you, Rick. Uh, Colin, I think this would be a good one for you. What would be a relevant unit of measure for scaffold quantities? I know you started to address this in the presentation. Yeah, that, that's a million dollar question, Andrew, and <laughs> we've ever asked that. It's, uh, you know, we've had a lot of uh, discussions within the working group on what that could be. Um, and I, I kind of mentioned a few uh, potential uh, candidates. And, and oh, if there's Lake Feet, which is very popular in North America, uh, there's pounds, which is popular in North America as well. I know in Europe, uh, cubic feet or cubic meters is uh, is the most common measure for scaffolding. I think um, whatever it ends up being, it's it just, I, and just to preface that part of the answer, all of those units of measure are functional. And they work for the, the, the groups that use them. And that's, that's good. That's what it needs to be. Um, I think the more important thing is that as a community, we agree on one or two um, to use. And if it's more than one, we just need to agree on as a community, how do we convert between them? Is there an easy way to go from lake feet to cubic meters and back or to pounds to cubic meters and lake feet and back? Um, that's what's going to allow us to be interoperable and to share our scaffold related data um, without that conversion factor, so to speak. I mean, and we do conversion factors, right? We go from, from cubic meters to cubic yards that's that's understood, but it's less clear with scaffolding, and that's where the the difficulty comes in. And you know, we've had some very spirited discussions within within our just within the working group, and that's not even involving the many many more people that would need to get involved in the community to answer that question. So it's not a straight answer. It's not the probably not a very satisfying answer, but that is it's something that as a community we need to work together on. Yeah, and I think the obvious recommendation with that and with the next one and talking about the recommended metrics there is the next step is just to go and download the report and read the report. And then if you've got some feedback for us on what we're present, providing and presenting there, get back to us. Let us know if you've got some additional feedback. Join the team, help steer the ship. Um, okay, let's pick in another one. Josh, is scaffolding like any other CWP then, where scaffolding is the discipline? Coming back on. So I think I'm going to have Rick jump in and share his thoughts because he's pretty passionate uh, on this uh, on this subject. So I think he might be a better one to to jump in. Um, uh, but I I think from the the biggest thing that that we came out of this is this need to think about this 
from, if you really want to optimize, you need to think about this across multiple disciplines. If we're thinking across uh, multiple disciplines, then we need to be thinking about uh, a larger area and optimizing it uh, from a CWP perspective. So um, I'm gonna let Rick jump in and share his thoughts because he's particularly passionate on this. Um, so Rick, do you wanna? Sure, so, sorry, camera. <laughs> I, I'm not following my rules. Um, the challenge we have with access and scaffold and being a CWP in and of itself is that we're not actually installing the assets and doing the hard craft work. Um, that said, should we be um, accountable to show a shared service level CWP? We think so, right? And maybe that's part of what we work on this coming year is figuring out how to make that actually work in the AWP framework because that access strategy matters and it matters at the CWP. The challenge is, is that we're not building the structure and setting priorities and you know, path of construction and those type things. So it's sort of a mixed bag with access. So uh, that's, that's probably the best answer we have so far. Excellent, thank you very much. Um, have you considered looking for a small pilot project to implement the recommendations? And I'll throw that open to anyone on the team. I don't know if anyone's started to look at a small pilot project for something like this, or is this something that has already been done and we can share some of the results? So I, as an as a organization from a CII perspective, no. Uh, we haven't done a collective piloting. There are uh, various levels of AWP maturity within access and scaffolding on projects and certainly recommend that folks uh, use pilot projects within their own organization. But if this question refers to from a CII perspective, have we collectively done uh, a pilot project or an analysis of a pilot project? No, we have not. Uh, but those that's an example of something that we may focus on in this coming year is when you talk about implementation barriers certainly setting up and choosing the correct pilot project and and uh, some of the criteria and recommendations on how to go about a pilot project those are examples of implementation overcoming implementation barriers uh, and tools that we've made in other areas of AWP. So that's certainly a potential focus of ours for next year, but we have not done a CIA, CII pilot, if that's the nature of this question. But we do have, I think each of our organizations have experience with either our clients um, or within our organization where we have successfully implemented uh, some level of AWP within uh, scaffold and access management. Thank you, Josh. Um, I'm going to pick on the one at the bottom here because it's got a fairly broad range. What has yeah, Andrew, been I just want to jump in and I just want to jump yeah. in and add a little bit of context to that uh, to that question as well. Um, sure. It's which is that the best practice. There's no there's no CI project like Josh said that encompasses all of the recommendations of this best practice, but the elements within the best practice I think individually have been tried on a number of projects by themselves, and those elements have been found to work um, in in, on, on their own, and that's what that's what led them to be in, included in the best practice. And it's not just once or twice, but it's those some of those elements um, have been proven on multiple occasions to to significantly improve scaffold performance. And that's that's what led them to be put there. But like Josh said, there, there is no pilot pilot project putting all of them into the same the same pot, so to speak, um, for for that for that proof of concept. So, so maybe if I can add to that, Colin, uh, yes, there, there is some really some forward thinking organizations that really drive that lean thought uh, and to be make scaffold more efficient and more predictable. Uh, but yes, as a to-do list, maybe uh, for the group, if they have maybe something, a pilot or something they want to try out, to reach out to us uh, and uh, maybe we could kind of like work side by side to see how the concept applies and, and, and how we can um, benefit from it. Yeah. So please reach out to Josh or Andrew if you have a project that, that might fit into this category and um, yeah, hopefully we can get something done. Fantastic. And with the few seconds we've got left, I'm gonna take a quick stab at the last one here. What is the biggest misunderstanding of how AWP can be applied to access management? And I think it's already been touched on a little bit. Traditionally, it's been seen as a constraint. Um, as Colin, I believe mentioned, it's one of the things, it was one of the check boxes is scaffolding in place. It was one of the sort of IWP constraints. 
Whereas now we're trying to elevate Scaffold away from just being that constraint and making it work unto itself, making it that discipline, make it a truly coordinated effort rather than just have we erected a piece of scaffolding. And with that, I realize we're hitting the top of the hour. So Lloyd, I think we are going to wrap it there. Well, thank you very much. Thanks everybody for attending and we'll see you at the next webinar. Uh, great job group. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thanks, everyone. Have a good day.